In the previous episode of Transistors, we took a look at how we can actually use transistors to store a little bit of information. We drew links between this and the RS knowledge back then when we actually looked at logic components and we saw how, well, conceptually they're similar, but we don't have to re-implement NOR gates in this regard. Back then, we didn't stop at latches, we moved on to talk about flip-flops and we saw how they were more versatile because they took in a clock pulse. Today, let's focus our energies on just that part, what a clock pulse really means and how we can handle an incoming clock pulse. You're watching another episode of Transistors. Hello and welcome back to Transistors. Now, as it turns out, responding to a clock pulse is not quite as simple as it sounds. To very quickly recap, Certain components require a clock signal coming in, and that will tell the component, you know, basically when to fire off. A clock pulse looks like this is a square wave that repeatedly alternates between two different states, usually a high logic state and zero volts, even though sometimes a negative version, you know, is used as well. But the most critical part of this is the fact that components don't respond to the high states or the low states. They respond to the transition from one state to the other. If you're transitioning from low to high, we call that the rising edge. And if we're transitioning from high to low, we call that the falling edge. So of course, the question is why? Why do we need to go to so much trouble to detect a rising and a falling edge? Well, the reason is because this brings us something special. And that is the fact that the rising and falling edges only occur for fleeting moments something that is very critical in certain circuits. Let's take a look at some examples of this. Now, previously we've seen our bistable multivibrator, and recall that, well, this setup is very stable. You set a state, it latches onto that state, and that's the end of it. It stays that way until you change that state. However, in some situations, it may be more advantageous to have an unstable circuit you may be able to express something, well, just more useful using that circuit. However, because it is unstable, you're going to have to manage it somehow so that the instability doesn't create problems in your implementation. Now, one very easy way to work around this is to have, say, some kind of control. So in this case, you can imagine this to be like a next button. And the idea is that the circuit will stay in its current state until you press this button. When you press it, the circuit is allowed to advance. So yeah, this is how you can sort of control the instability. However, this creates another issue. You see, pressing down that button, you know, just manually, is something that will take a small amount of time. And what that means is that input is going to stay high for, well, some amount of time. The problem is, no matter how little time that is, that is still time for the circuit to oscillate. Even if you were to press the button really quickly, who knows, the circuit may have advanced say 5 states while you have the button pressed down. So you don't want that. You want to guarantee that this is high for as short a period of time as possible. How we can do this is we can implement a control circuit which actually feeds into the next button. The idea is you don't interact directly with this button, you interact only with the control circuit. And then the control circuit can act as a filter to basically prevent the problem with just C. Here's how this works. The input to the control circuit is going to take on the same pattern as we've seen just now. You press the button, the input goes high for a period of time until you release it. Even if this is very fast, let's just say this is too much and we want to actually cut the time down. An ideal control circuit will look for the moment in which the state transitions from low to high, also known as our rising edge, and basically generate just one tiny pulse at that time. So this is the output of our control circuit, which goes on to feed our actual unstable circuit. Because we are able to cut down this time to such a tiny fleeting moment, we can be, well, more certain that the circuit will not oscillate wildly. Of course, this is sort of the perfect scenario where we cut down the entire thing to just a fleeting pulse 
taking basically no time at all. Of course, in a real world, it's not quite as nice. Usually what happens is if we have a rising edge detector, what that's going to create is a tiny pulse when the button is actually pushed down or when the input goes high, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be fed by a button. The idea is we want this pulse to decay as quickly as possible to go back down to zero. And hopefully, well, if this pulse is short enough, then it will be treated as, you know, just high for a very short moment. Of course, this is a rising edge detector, nothing stopping us from having a falling edge detector, which will do the same thing, but it is triggered by the falling edge instead of the rising edge. This is essentially what we're going to be building today. We're going to be building our control circuit, which is simply an edge detector, whether it be the rising edge or the falling edge. Let's take a look at how this can be done. As it turns out, such functionality isn't all that easy to do. In fact, with just transistors alone, you can't really do something like that, which is why we introduce a new component, the humble capacitor. A capacitor is a very simple tool and yet extremely powerful in this regard. Let's first take a look at what it actually is, how it works, and we'll use it in a circuit to see how it can act as a pulse detector. First and foremost, this is what a capacitor looks like, right? Just a simple two-legged component. Now, there's actually another kind of capacitor that, you know, exists out there. That sort actually has polarity. One of the legs are positive, one of the legs are negative. This one, however, does not. It does not have any polarity at all. I can sort of flip it around, right? It will work the same both ways. But what does it actually do? In fact, at its simplest, you can think of a capacitor as a rechargeable battery. Well, it stores a little bit of charge, which is why it's similar in that regard. Now, what I have here are two leads, one positive, one negative, and I have my capacitor right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in my capacitor like so. What happens now is I am so-called charging my capacitor, and basically it just takes a moment to charge up. When I pull it out, the charge is stored in the capacitor. And I can prove this by actually connecting this to an LED. Watch as the moment I actually touch down, the LED lights up. See that? Do you see it blink for uh, just a fleeting moment? Let's do that again. Charge. Come over here. Discharge. Now, in case you're confused as to when a capacitor charges and discharges, well, one easy way is to think of this in terms of, well, who's the stronger guy? This is what I mean. Let's say we connect a power source to an empty capacitor. Clearly, the power source has more juice, right? It's the stronger one of the two. And therefore, charge flows from your power source towards your capacitor. Your capacitor will then charge up as a result of this. Eventually, well, both are going to be equal. Your capacitor is going to be full. And as a result, there is no more flow of current. They are in equilibrium, so to speak. Let's now remove the power source and let's bring along an LED instead. Now, the stronger party here is of course our capacitor. And as a result, our current now flows from the capacitor towards the LED. That of course causes our LED to light up. Well, for a fleeting moment, as long as our capacitor is full, again, once our capacitor is depleted, well, the LED will no longer light up and there will no longer be a movement of charge. While we've seen how a capacitor in isolation can work, it's not really immediately clear yet how we can use it as a pulse detector. So let's take a look at that. This is our experimental setup with a capacitor here, which will basically you know, show us this pulse detection in action. But there is a lot going on here. So let's start by removing some of the complexity from this circuit. Essentially, what we have now is a capacitor like this. Remember, it's just a rechargeable battery. And what we've done here is we've connected two LEDs in opposing directions. See, notice that this LED is flipped around, right? So the idea being, if current flows one way, it will flow through this LED and light it up. If it flows the other way, it will light up this LED instead. There is a very good reason why we are doing this. In fact, this is here to show us something interesting about the capacitor. 
Now, assume that this capacitor is empty. Like just now, what we're going to do is we're going to charge up this capacitor. But instead of charging just the capacitor itself, we're going to charge this entire circuit. And how we're going to do that is we're going to put plus on one side, minus on the other. And as you can expect, there is a flow of charge. Current flows from left to right in this picture, and charge is being accumulated inside this capacitor. Now, there is one interesting thing to note, and that is the fact that when the capacitor is done charging, current no longer flows from left to right. In fact, because the capacitor is full, it breaks the circuit. What this means is if we were to go back, as long as current is flowing, of course your LED comes on. However, when your capacitor is done charging, it breaks the circuit, charge can no longer flow, your LED goes off. As you can imagine, what this means is your LED will really only be on as long as the capacitor is charging. And since the capacitor charges really quickly, essentially your LED will only blink once. And then, well, it will go off because the capacitor is now full and current no longer flows. Do note of course that at no point of time will this other LED come on because we're talking about current flowing in this direction and that does not switch on an LED that is connected in this manner with negative here and positive there. So now we have a full capacitor, let's now look at how we can drain this. How we can do that is to basically give the charge in here a chance to escape. We use a pull down resistor to allow the charge from the capacitor to escape. However, at present moment, we still have our power coming in like so. As a result, the capacitor remains full. There is no sort of escape of charge via this pin just yet. However, the moment we remove the source of power, what is going to happen now is that the capacitor will discharge. Current now moves across the same circuit from right to left, discharging through the pull down resistor. Since there is a flow of charge in the reverse direction now, this LED comes on. Again, for just a fleeting moment, when we deplete the capacitor, well, there is no more flow of charge, the LED goes off. So what is the purpose of this entire exercise? Remember, this is our entire setup. And really the only special thing we're doing here is that we now have a push button which actually controls whether we are charging our capacitor or not. If this button is released, the capacitor is basically not connected to a high state here and it is in so-called discharging mode. When the button is pushed down, a high state flows through like this and it charges the capacitor. What this means is the moment we press this button down, your capacitor charges for a fleeting moment which lights up this LED. Once it's done charging, everything goes off. When you let go, you're giving the collected charge a chance to escape. That lights up this LED for a fleeting moment. And then again, everything goes off. What we've done is we've essentially created a detector here, which fires at the instant in which this button is pressed and at the instant in which it is released and at no other point. In other words, we have just built something that detects the rising and falling edges of the current that is coming in here. So in fact, this is our pulse detector. Let us now build this on a breadboard and we can see this in action. So right, what we have here is the physical version of what we've just seen on the slides. We have our push button here Right, it's taking high, you know, positive state from the battery. The negative goes on the negative rail here. Our switch state is coming out and feeding our capacitor over here. That is going out to two LEDs and they are, you know, just like our schematic, connects it in opposite directions. Both of these go back down to ground via this wire right here. So yeah, the idea is when I push down on the switch, our blue LED should light up. When we let go, the red one will light up for a fleeting moment. So to make this a little bit better, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch off the light here. Right, so I'm going to push it down. There, you saw that blue light just come up for a fraction of a second. I'm going to let go. And there you go, the red light just flashed for a fraction of a second. 
So I'm going to go ahead and bring the lights back on. What we've just seen is the magic of a capacitor set up as a pulse detector and is able to detect both our rising and our falling edges as generated by our push button over here. That's all there is for this particular episode. Hopefully this has been an interesting digression. Next time we'll see how we can actually make use of our pulse detector to do certain computation for us. That's all there is for this episode. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.